Hi, let me uh, welcome you to the session about the Open Society Foundation uh, Summer Internships for 2013 uh, in Governance and uh, Human Rights. Uh, this is the second year of this program. It is specifically aimed at students uh, in schools of public policy. There will be nine schools around the world participating this year and uh, as many as three or four candidates from each school will be selected. Uh, we have posted on the Carsoner website uh, the application itself, uh, a handbook for students, uh, and we welcome you to, to, to uh, peruse these. Uh, today we're going to have three people who are going to make presentations. Uh, two are students who participated last summer, uh, Divya and Kavita, uh, and then uh, Doug uh, Johnson, who along with his wife Catherine Sickink, uh, were the primary faculty, uh, will give a little bit of an overview of their perspective of the two-week intensive didactic session, that is a teaching session uh, held in Budapest uh, to begin. That will be from June 13th to June 25th this summer. Uh, and following that two-week intensive, the students will then serve internships from six to eight weeks long at any of uh, about 40 NGOs that have identified and agreed to accept students uh, with agreements from OSF. Uh, you can also suggest your own NGO uh, and if selected, OSF will try to work out an agreement uh, for your mentorship uh, in that NGO. The applications will be due uh, at the uh, midnight on uh, Friday, uh, November 15th, so please uh, stick to that deadline. Uh, you'll be notified if you're selected for the process uh, uh, sometime in January, uh, so that hopefully there's time to make uh, uh, appropriate plans for this uh, great opportunity. We encourage you to uh, uh, seek out any questions that aren't answered uh, in the materials on the website uh, from any of our car center staff. Thanks so much. And this internship is really a great opportunity because if your idea of an internship is a lot of fun and partying, <laughs> gone ahead. Anyway, if it's, if it's a lot of fun and partying, you saw the pictures, the first one that was there. And if it's also a lot of serious work that you want to do in your chosen area of field, that interests you. And if you'd like to meet leading human rights activists from across, across the world, some of the best professors, and at the same time get an experience where you get to know fellow activists from other parts of the world, then this is the internship. Now, when I applied for the internship, I had no idea the kind of people I get to meet, like Doug and also Soros, as you can see here in the picture, he gave himself, George Soros, for the internship. He spent a day with us, part of it, sharing his stories, part of it with the professors, and also we had a Q&A session where we could interact with him and ask questions about what the Soros Foundation does, what the Open Society does, what are the organizations that they fund across the world, what kind of work they do, and what do they see as the future ahead. And uh, through their insights, you can see Doug there as well. And um, that's Christoph, who heads our uh, Open Society's uh, program in Budapest. And that's Lenny, who heads Open Society's program and is based in New York. And everybody came down, and that's the uh, seriousness with which they uh, hold this seminar and the internship program so that you get an idea about it. I hope the slides work out. Okay. So the Open Society, the mission is. Um, to strengthen the rule of law and to uh, build vibrant democracies and to also work on human rights issues for marginalized communities. And if you're interested in any of these areas or genres as your public uh, policy focus area, then um, this is a wonderful opportunity for you because how it works is, so how the internship is structured is that it's 10 days of the seminar in Budapest. I don't know if they've made it two weeks this year, but you could, it's 10 days in Budapest, and then it's followed by six to eight weeks of an internship with a policy or rights-based uh, nonprofit organization. So um, what I said in terms of you could choose what you want to do is your policy area of focus. So if you're interested in, in child rights or children's rights or disability rights or LGBT rights or you want to have democracy strengthened, any of these policy areas, what is your passion? You could choose your policy area of focus and you could structure what you want to do through the internship in your policy area focus. And then you can apply for the NGO that you choose to work with. More often than not, that you do get your choice of NGO. Both of us got our choice of NGOs. And it's a matching process. The NGO has to like your application. It has to fit in with what they want to do. And then if that works out, then you get exactly 
but an internship that you self-design for yourself. So that's the best part about the internship. Um, the visa is part of the student's responsibility. You are responsible to get the visas, whereas the Open Society facilitates and reimburses all costs, but you're supposed to find out, let's say you want to go and work in Bulgaria or Burma or Indonesia, then you figure out how to get the visa. They will help you with all of that. And uh, the best part about the internship is that the siphon covers all your costs for the internship. So um, this, uh, the mission of Open Society through this internship is that most of us really want to work on pressing issues that affect people, but um, human rights activists most often do not have the funds or the resources to actually choose what they want to do, and a lot of us go into banking or private equity because mm -hmm. we don't have the funds to do it, and Open Society wants to help us do what we really care about by making it possible for us. So that's, in a sense, um, the internship. And of course, it helps <laughs> because it's in Budapest. <laughs> so um, it's really a nice place to, you know. Is that the uh, striking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I figure out where and why. <laughs> this is the Buda Castle. This is the Buda Castle. Right oh, at the yeah. top when we did the tour. Yeah. So, and, and, and Doug and Catherine uh, structured the internship and they did it so well. Um, we were not just sitting in class or as you know as in a seminar, but we had breakouts during the day in the afternoon where we would just go out and explore the city and and do fun activities and games. So that made it all the more interesting and vibrant. And um, Catherine is uh, the one who leads the seminar. Uh, she's the one who structures it. She's one of the leading human rights uh, professors, and Doug is uh, one of the leading human rights activists. Uh, Doug uh, took on um, Nestle uh, uh, for its sale of uh, baby instant food uh, in Africa, and, and he led uh, a, a national movement in the US which again spread globally, and uh, he does share a lot of the strategic tactics of how to go about doing a movement. And uh, I'd hand it over to Devia to now yeah. talk. Yeah, I think Avita has covered most of it, but just wanted to mention uh, like the faculty and the resource persons whom we have, um, who we have an opportunity to interact so closely because we, um, it, like the schedule was pretty rigorous, so we ended up spending like most part of the day uh, with the faculty around, even on fun trips, uh, we had like dinners every day um, in which we could just sit with them and chat with them about the work that they have done in the past and uh, Doug had uh, initiated this wonderful um, uh, wonderful series of personal narratives uh, which is a which is a framework that's taught uh, in at the Kennedy School by Professor Marshall Gans. So that was um, and, and the wonderful thing that I felt was that um, even the faculty had to do it. So so every night during dinner we would have each of the faculty and the resource persons talking to us about their own personal journey through this uh, 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 in the human rights field and what are the issues that they care so passionately about and what is it uh, in their own personal backgrounds that has contributed to this journey. So that was like a great opportunity uh, as far as I was concerned to really get to know people like their motivations, their passions and then uh, and then it also helps you in, and it was a very diverse set of faculty for example uh, in the previous photo with Catherine there was Dan Large, he, he, um, he, his focus area is on the rising powers um, uh, like India, China, um, he works a lot in Africa. There was Sanjeev Khargam who uh, works a lot on transparency issues. Then uh, there was Catherine, another <laughs> a second Catherine who had experience with UN. Um, 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 there was um, a professor from Argentina um, who was um, Catalina. She had also um, had a lot of experience in working with judicial activism. So it was really like um, a, a wonderful set of faculty and resource persons who um, who had so much experience uh, and insight into how to how to really take this on as a career um, uh, um, and, 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 and work effectively towards on these issues. Um, and then there was a series of um, um, mentorship. Uh, <laughs> this is this is an exercise that uh, Doug had uh, uh, initiated in class in which we were trying to all. Uh, um, I think roll no, over the should. blanket. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't do it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, uh, so there was a series of mentorship um, initiatives um, that we were part of so we could um, um, engage more closely with each of the faculty depending on our areas of interest and then they would guide us in the project that like the self-design project that we had taken on that um, Kavita just mentioned. So, so that was also really useful in structuring, um, like giving a, a, a like a kind of structure to your own ideas and uh, and think through uh, like what are some frameworks that you could use in analyzing these issues. Um, 
Yeah. So to take over um, and to add to what they just said, um, what uh, I really liked about the internship was that uh, it's called a clinical seminar and, and uh, it gives you not just theoretical aspects, but as Doug is going to walk you through, it gives you real practical skill sets, strategic skill sets, if you want to organize change, how to go about it. But um, there's nothing clinical about it. It's very warm. So by the end of it, like, you know, we were all one big family and we shared our personal stories with each other and we knew each other intimately. And, and it's, it's really um, hectic because it starts at 8 in the morning with breakfast and it goes on till 8, you know, in the evening. But even after that, we would all go out and hang out and have drinks till 11, 12 at night. So it's just uh, really warm and all of us bonded together as a family. So uh, and. The uh, Open Society, what it does is, is it wants to create an alumni network, just like we have the Harvard Alumni Network. So you have an alumni network of activists, fellow activists, so you can stay in touch for the next many um, batches of alumni uh, uh, who actually go out. So that's one of the really good parts. And um, to talk about the second part of the internship, which is your six or eight weeks part, which would be the, the chunk of your internship. Uh, I chose to work on disability rights because I worked on disability rights for close to a decade and I wanted to work with Human Rights Watch. Uh, Human Rights Watch had just started its disability rights division and um, what was uh, really important for me was um, to work with them at the UN convention on the CRPD, that's the convention on the rights of people with disabilities and I really wanted to be a part of it. And I'm really grateful that the Open Society internship um, helped me match uh, or get the internship that I wanted with Human Rights Watch which made it possible for me to attend the UN convention and uh, to actually uh, participate in the sessions where we discussed uh, why the MDGs need to address the, uh, uh, the people uh, with disabilities because they constitute 10% uh, of the world's population but 20% uh, of the poor. And um, it was really insightful for me because it's the first time I ever attended, attended a UN convention. And uh, more importantly, it was uh, on a cause that I really wanted um, to work for and to see in, in uh, uh, process how a convention works, how do you lobby, how do you uh, do advocacy for the causes that you want to. And uh, on the other side, I complemented it with research that I wanted to do on, on um, education uh, for children with disabilities and uh, inclusive education. And that's the research that I did with Human Rights Watch because that's something that they're working on. So it was really a meaningful experience because uh, it was research-based. It also gave me an opportunity at the highest echelons of decision-making at the UN to see how it's done and, um, and to build the networks that actually help you uh, professionally as well as personally to really achieve your full potential. And I just give it to the Beatrice for her to walk through. So my, uh, my experience before coming to Kennedy School was uh, with a grassroots NGO in India and we worked on issues of internal migration. So we worked with seasonal mi like tribal migrants who moved from like rural areas to urban destinations. And since my uh, experience was very um, uh, like grassroots operation based, I was always interested in um, uh, like like the policy um, uh, um, uh, like pop the, the policy levels like how uh, because in India like one of the major issues is that uh, there is an absolute policy vacuum uh, in terms of um, in terms of um, uh, the welfare of these seasonal migrants. So that was my really like interest area, and also coming to the Kennedy School as well. So um, uh, uh, the Open Society Foundation actually put me in touch with the Migration Policy Institute in Washington D.C. So that was a perfect fit for my interests, and 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 that's what I had asked for. So I I, I got to work with them, and I spent six weeks there, which was a great opportunity to look at um, what are the uh, different policies adopted uh, by the other developing countries um, in this area. Um, and, uh, so fr in, in my experience, I actually looked at this issue from a very service delivery perspective, so I had not really worked, looked at this issue from a rights-based perspective. So, so after taking the clinical seminar and then going to MPI, it really helped me like marry these two approaches because in India there's always a dichotomy between like rights-based work and needs-based work. So, so here it, it really helped me marry these two uh, like different approaches and how could I use this rights-based rhetoric to uh, to take this forward. So that that for me was a very useful. Um, uh, like learning, and at the at the MPI, like I got to interact with uh, some of the uh, like really 
influential like um, researchers and policy makers in this arena. Though they don't directly work on issues of internal migration, so my work was kind of complementary to the work that they did. And I, 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 I they helped me set, set up meetings at the Brookings Institute um, on in, in like with the division on internal displacement. So all of that was like uh, really useful for me. And um, and now I've got a really good opportunity where they're publishing two of the papers that I wrote. Um, in the summer, so 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 it's it was overall like a very interesting. Would you say something about uh, or did you argue where the other students were from and yeah. what you learned from? Yeah, yeah. So the other students uh, uh, were from um, different parts of the world. So there were uh, I think six universities where we were from. Um, uh, uh, the uh, like Oxford, uh, Harvard, Kennedy School. Um, there was one student from the Harvard uh, Law School, um, then San, Science Po in, in Paris. Um, uh, from Argentina, we had two students, um, and from OP Jindal University in New Delhi. So it was like a completely diverse and international crowd, and we had students from Africa, China, yeah, we had two students from Chinese universities as well. So um, basically like Africa, China, Canada, Australia, India. Uh, so it was like a, a, a truly diverse group of people who had worked on very diverse issues as well. So all that really enriched our discussion. Uh, and one thing that I that we missed out saying earlier was uh, Chris Stone, who heads Open Society Foundation, was also actually there. He he used to head the Horses Center here, so he had also come down. And that was one of the interactions that was personally like very exciting. Catherine Sitting uh, and I are co-directors of this program. Uh, we agreed to do it for one more year, but we're bringing on uh, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito from Colombia to be uh, acting with us, and then then he will take over with another person for two years. And so there's kind of a rotation uh, among the faculty and the leadership, uh, at which time Catherine and I may go and teach there, but um, in particular she doesn't want uh, the spend the amount of time that, uh, that it takes to administer this program. So um, we will be there this time. And there will be, I would say, a lot of overlap between the class we're doing in the spring uh, on the theory and practice of human rights with um, what we do at the seminar. Because uh, in fact, what we've uh, been doing is trying to develop this course. Uh, we started it with it at Oxford, then we went to Budapest, expanded it considerably, and we're taking what we learned there to try and bring it to the classroom here, and what we learn here, we'll try and take it back there. So should you do both? Um, if you do both, we're going to be practicing certain leadership skills, especially on um, ways of developing your strategic thinking capacities. Um, and so just as we had one student who uh, was with us in Oxford um, uh, at our class there, uh, we had her in uh, Budapest, and we were able to then tap into her uh, to help coach others. Uh, and uh, if, if uh, you ever want to know how to re really learn a skill, it's try and teach it to somebody else. So I, I would say that uh, the advantage of the overlap is really on the questions of practice. And then to recognize that the that trying to integrate good social science research into how you think about your practice is a difficult thing. And that uh, it well, it takes time to try and develop those instincts and to experiment with the application. It's also true that a good activist is always theorizing. Uh, they, they're bringing to bear some theory of cause and, and, uh, that leads to change. And, um, and I think what you'll find from the, the faculty who are there is that uh, many of them, but I certainly know Professor Sicking uh, has, <coughs> has uh, systemized uh, theoretical insights from looking at the practice of activists. So uh, it is a praxis form of learning. It is a combination of, of uh, reflection and action um, that we'll do together. Um, as uh, Kavita mentioned, we have 
a number of different uh, learning experiences. Uh, one is personal narrative. Uh, have any of you had Marshall Gantz's class on personal narrative? So I didn't have the personal narrative class, but I had the organizing class, which was a part of personal narrative. Okay, good. So we will uh, be developing the skills of personal narrative because one of the key uh, objectives of the Open Society Foundation with this program is to try and identify and develop the next generation of human rights leaders. So what are leadership skills that you need to develop? And uh, I think Marshall is, uh, makes a very compelling case, um, uh, and most activists know the power of it, is that when you learn to master telling a story, that really emerges from your own values and your own experience, um, and you learn to engage those values with others, then you create a powerful dynamic. Um, and that one of the key problems in any organization, but especially underfunded organizations where everybody's working hard, is, um, is the power of the story is what keeps us coming back every day. So it's an essential leadership skill. We'll practice it. We have the faculty tell personal narratives too, uh, for two reasons. One, so that you understand their, um, why they do what they do, but also to give you a hint by looking at a, a wide variety of people of different ways that people have in their lives entered the human rights world uh, to, find, to find a practice in the hopes that uh, you'll understand that not one path. Um, and certainly to understand you don't need to go to law school uh, to work on human rights. Um, but there are many paths to it, and the stories of, uh, of these people will, I hope, reveal to you that opportunity. One of the real values of this as well is that I don't know how many faculty you'll have this year, but probably uh, a total of seven of us. We're doubling the size from 14 to 28. Uh, and we'll have some more faculty as, as a result. And the faculty's responsibility is not only uh, to develop a uh, set of program around their specialization and their interests, but to function as a mentor um, to each of you. So there are a number of sessions that are developed in those 10 days so that you both meet in a small group um, talking about your projects and where you're going to go and, and other issues of importance, but you'll also have a chance of one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring with one of the faculties uh, who are there. We try and identify uh, the, the person who has the most experience in the project you have in mind, but we really can't cover the entire uh, 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 territory, so we'll do the best job we can of matching you up. Um, and I think that was a good experience. Then we have uh, a set of conversations about theory um, and the application of good research to uh, human rights issues, and then uh, sessions on practice, um, where again, uh, we're trying primarily to develop uh, uh, ways of thinking and methods that help you develop your own capacity um, for good strategic thought. Um, and we're not teaching tactics um, because, again, we're looking at what are the general skills um, of leadership that, uh, that we want uh, to see available to the human rights community in the future. So it is intensive. We're going to pull back a little on that because everyone was too exhausted, mm -hmm. uh, the faculty as well as um, the students. But it will still be uh, intensive. Uh, uh, it does involve lots of opportunities to see Budapest, which I had no idea is certainly one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Um, and you'll have a chance to see it uh, from on high and from on low, uh, because many students did, in fact, visit many bars. Uh, <laughs> so let me just uh, stop and then have a chance for you all to, uh, to talk with each other about so I had a question now. Is it open to graduating students as in now? Is our 
uh, is it uh, interesting to depict Lua in that middle of the course? So, because I plagiarized it in May and I would like to, I like to apply for it as it opens. It, it was intended to be uh, between first and second year. Uh, but there were some exceptions to that rule, as uh, Amita said, uh, somehow a graduate from the law school snuck in. So uh, what this means is that uh, we, will, we will interview people who we think, uh, and, and forward the names who we think would be the best students and uh, who would add the most, but also who have real leadership potential. And then Open Society will uh, actually do the interview, and they make the final, uh, uh, the final uh, selection uh, from each school. So I would say you're not precluded, uh, given what I see as the as the habits of the past. Uh, but the hope is that, uh, especially by targeting people in their first year, that um, they'll come back. They will have learned something from their organization, but hopefully you will negotiate with them on something that would be helpful to them in the future, such as uh, a research project um, that you can come and engage your fellow students with or that you could use for your PAE. Um, so what we hope to do is allow you, uh, encourage you to develop a relationship with the organization and think how you pay them back, uh, if you will, by, uh, by doing something useful. For every organization, it's a very expensive process of taking up an internship. You're not free labor, you're, uh, because you're going to have a mentor at the, at the organization. Um, and that takes time away from their busy schedules. Uh, but they've all agreed to do that. And I'm sure some do it better than others. Uh, but. Uh, I, I also want to underscore that one of the reasons that Catherine and I agreed to take this on was precisely because it was aimed at public policy students rather than law students. Um, we love lawyers, but <laughs> I actually think they do a really good job uh, at the many human rights centers and law schools around the world. Uh, and they're producing uh, as many uh, lawyers as we, we can actually put to work, I think. Uh, but the ne what they neglected is the development of uh, other capacities that are needed to make a change in human rights. So uh, that's why they're focusing on the public policy schools and why uh, we agree to be part of it. So I actually I asked the uh, program officer at OSF, was this open to friends of mid careers who were just here for a year? And he said absolutely, so I think you're all covered. About what? About undergraduate program. Yeah. 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 It's what he said in the conversation. I, yeah, I don't think it's appropriate for undergrads. It's going to be um, a tougher uh, pull than that. The last question with this, uh, uh, any thoughts and insights on the presidential fellowship of uh, open society? Did you get? Actually, um, the, the student from law school who had come in, she was actually going on to the presidential fellowship. So that's why, she, though she was a graduate, she came in because it was sort of an immersion process for her into open society. So it sort of bridged her joining the open society. So you apply for both if you want to do both. Uh, but you won't be, uh, we all agreed that that was a mistake uh, for her to uh, take in both positions. So uh, if you do apply for both, then you'll have to select which one you want. Um, just to clarify the organizations, um, I see here that there's a list of confirmed host institutions, but then you also mentioned that we could find our own organization that we wanted to intern for, and is that limited to OSF grantees? No. Uh, the advantage of the OSF Mm -hmm. uh, funded organization is that OSF has the leverage mm -hmm. to get them to be serious about yeah. the mentorship uh, uh, and using the resources and uh, they, they compensate mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. uh, some for that. Um, so uh, you have a particular organization that you're interested in working with? Um, it's, I'm not, I, there are a few of them that, um, that have to be searched more. I also, I mean, 
I also haven't heard of most of these um, institutions listed here, so I'd like to see more about what they did as well. Yeah, they were really attempting to especially uh, get into various levels, yeah. including groups that work on the grassroots mm -hmm. and in various parts of the world to give a, you know, a, an interesting set of choices uh, for you. Um, yeah. and, and one of the advantages of OSF is it probably funds more broadly mm -hmm. and deeply than any other uh, funder in the field. But they are open to it if you have uh, an agreed internship with someone else and then they would try and also not intervene but uh, work with that institution mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, that they were going to be able to mm -hmm. provide uh, mentoring and serious work for you mm -hmm. rather than copying or yeah. stealing. So you guys both seem like you have pretty deep experience in in the areas that you ended up focusing on prior to, you know, prior to the um, internship. You actually already had a lot of experience within that area. Um, so can you speak towards like how people generally, you know, did people generally go with something that they already knew, you know, had a lot of experience in, um, or did some people sort of switch into something new and how people would actually choose that. So I thought it was a very diverse group. So some people came in with a lot of experience, and some people had some experience and wanted to work in a particular field and so on to be at the seminar. So we had a wide diversity. And uh, But I would still say um, it, it leaned more heavily on, on the side of people coming with a lot of experience in the areas that they've already worked in. And, and that's why the seminar was so much more interesting because they brought that to the table and everybody shared that. And the learning was from the mutual learning that everybody brought in. Like Vivya shared a lot about migration, so I stand educated about that. I shared a lot about disability. And so, so it was also about educating fellow people. So it, it adds uh, if you are bringing in that experience to the seminar and it makes it more uh, lively and uh, full of learning for students. At the same time, it also, as if someone is fresh and brings in a fresh pair of perspective. So we had a few students who were really outstanding and brilliant but were young but wanted to take on. So so I would say 90-10. Yeah, they have all had some level of experience, experience. but uh, particularly the, the two students from Blavatnik were probably the youngest. Uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately, probably both of them have decided to go to law school. Uh, but, uh, but most of the others, well, that's not true. The Chinese students yeah. both were engaged with NGO work. Uh, they brought in experience. Home. They brought in experience, experience, but they also were relatively young. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think the, the issues that they, the Chinese students took on were also new. Uh, it was not something that they had already worked. Like one of them was working on transparency issues, and uh, the other was looking at like funding and uh, funding of NGOs. So, so th these were not exactly the one the issues that they had worked on earlier, but they were interested in going in. And they also brought in, you know, different perspectives because Open Society looks at, I mean, Soros founded it to help uh, countries transition away from communism, but there were three Chinese students who were, you know, coming from a communist uh, environment, and they actually had a very interesting uh, opinions about it, and, and we had lively discussions about democracy and communism within that, so it's, it's so different perspectives, of the conversations go to different uh, areas. So it's not just maybe your area of work within, uh, let's say, funding or transparency. It, it, you know, it's concentric circles. It goes into other, other areas as well in terms of democracy, communism, capitalism. So it's, yeah. Right, question. So you guys both did research as part of your guys' internships. Um, is that pretty consistent across all the so mine was a mix of both because there was a UN convention for which Human Rights Watch was gearing up for and it was one of the most important ones because the next round of the Millennium Development Goals, um, you know, we want to have disability as part of it. And so the convention was geared around that and that was something that I wanted to be participating in so we worked towards that and it's one of the sessions was on inclusive education for children so I helped them with that. But let's say if that were not there, then it would be what they would want to do. And, and I also did part of that, which was researching what their existing 
project for the year was on education for children with disabilities and, uh, and helping them with that. So part of it was that. But there were other projects, for instance, Divya worked with migration and she used some of her earlier research and what she'd done in India. And the organization had not looked at internal migration, so they used the, her experience and her past work to you know, figure out work. And we had uh, one of the students who went to Burma and she, her, her work was in the field. Yeah. So it's, it's, it was not at, um, so the more you, so for us we worked in the U.S., we worked on th in, in think tanks and advocacy groups, our work was sort of different, but a lot of people chose to go out in Africa, in Burma, and there you're actually working in the field. So that is probably not research, you'd be engaging, you know, so, um, so the student who went to Burma actually was planning to go and sit in, and she was working on the law system and the judicial reform there, so she was planning to go and sit in the courts and, and figure out how the judicial system works, and one of the students went to Africa, and she also had a lot of field work, so, so it depends how you want to customize your internship, where you want to go, what kind of project, and the NGO, and what they want to do, so it's, everything has to be. Yeah, the group went to, uh, one of the Indian girls was there that she went to, she was in Poland and she interacted with a lot of elected women representatives in, in Poland and then she hoped to take that, take those learnings back to India. So so that was also like a cross-cultural, uh, like kind of learning. So yeah, I think it's really like self-designed. If you want to engage in field study, I think there's ample scope for that. But um, because uh, both of us are already had some kind of like uh, field experience before, so we, we wanted to focus on more like research and policy, but I don't think that's like a good condition for designing. Yeah. Did you have any like prior interaction <coughs> with the organization itself yeah. um, before you applied? Yeah, uh, not not before I applied, but I had looked them up online because mm -hmm. this was my interest area, and then and I. I understood that OSF was funding uh, them, so I, I though my organization was not in the initial roster, so I had mm -hmm. asked them separately whether uh, this would be possible because I knew that they were around. Mm -hmm. uh, so then OSF matched me, and then after that we had like interactions with our mentor in the organization, and mm -hmm. kind of developing the project and, and what would be the contours that they would be interested in, what would be the overlaps. Yeah, and for me, I, I wanted to work with Human Rights Watch even before the OSF internship made, came out, so I was, but then that came out, so it was um, through the OSF that I applied to Human Rights Watch, so, and Human Rights Watch is funded by OSF, mm -hmm. so it just was a perfect fit, and then um, once the selection process was over, then I was in touch with them, and so it was easy because it was on the list of um, NGOs that you could apply to, so it fitted with what I wanted to do. And uh, like the way I said, both of us had a lot of field experience in the developing world, so we chose what we want. But for some of you, you may want to go out in the field, and so that works too. And then when that happens, um, you can choose, even if some, there's a way to go about it, there are some organizations that are not on the list, but you may want to work with them, and OSF can figure out whether they can become a grantee. And then that's the process that you need to figure out before the application process by, you know, mm -hmm. figuring out how that, so that is some bit of lies in which you would have to do. I don't think that has to happen though before the application, especially because the application is due in mm -hmm. 30 days. Oh, two weeks. Yeah. I thought it was the end of November. The, uh, no, we have to November submit our recommendations to them by the end of November, but it looks like they want your applications in by mm -hmm. November 15th, so that's probably midnight on the 15th, uh, which is a Friday. So, uh, I think you could discuss in your application a particular interest in an organization and why you're interested but, uh, in that organization, but that won't be the primary uh, mm -hmm. make or break about your application, uh, but it'll be part of a negotiation. For example, as I look through the, um, the people who were in, who did come, the 14 people who came, uh, Quite a number had listed Human Rights Watch as their the choice of where they wanted to go, but Human Rights Watch would only take one person, uh, and someone got uh, lucky or uh, was the right person at the right time because they want they were starting something new, so they could see that having her background was pretty going to be particularly useful to them. So uh, don't uh, don't be flexible. Uh, state 
what you're interested in and why. It's that why that will be important to SF because as they evaluate your seriousness. Uh, but you might not get that organization. That organization might not agree to, to, to see you. Um, and there may be a better fit in OSF's mind uh, with another organization, given what you, the why of your interest. Doug, I have a question for you. Since uh, they list seven participating institutions, that is, nominating institutions, uh, and there are 28 slots, uh, I'm sorry, there's eight uh, participating institutions, can we assume that there will be either three or four from each institution that are probably selected? Uh, yes. Um, last year they told us that, that they would take two, uh, but then they ended up taking three from CS Poe and from Harvard. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll, well, they may decide that our candidates aren't, don't meet the mark of other groups and they may only take one or they may take two or they may take three. Um, it really depends on what the final mix looks like. Uh, but, but they've added uh, two schools this year that weren't in last year and they've subtracted one. So um, detail at it from Argentina turned out not to be a really great fit because they actually didn't have a public policy school. Uh, and so we got two PhD students uh, and, um, and I think they, well, they both had very interesting internships that were in line with what they wanted to do. But if that was less in line with what uh, OSF wanted to do with this program. So they've added uh, the University of Pretoria in South Africa and Universidad de los Andes from uh, Bogota, which is where uh, uh, Cesar uh, teaches. Um, and so, uh, they, they, actually, they've also added another school uh, to this mix, which is the Central European University, which started its public policy school this year. So it's their first class. They're a co-sponsor of the event. So there's actually going to be nine schools uh, for 28 slots. So about three. So, about three. so I have a last question. Uh, you know, is it, uh, so, uh, so the kind of project you engage with, uh, uh, can it be, does it need to be like, both of you guys, the like thematic one of an internal migration slash, uh, so either it could be a constituency or it would be a, uh, can it also be uh, something which is institutionally cross, an institutional issue, for example, is it, uh, so if I look at uh, institutional restructuring in a large scale, human rights non-profit, can that be a focus and uh, uh, other than a job? constituency or a uh, issue so, is that possible to talk? Yeah, I think uh, Chris, Krishna actually did something that, that our law schools could she did something based on um, uh, the politics of like funding within human rights. Okay. So that's like a good example uh, the direction that you're suggesting. And then like this transparency thing that I was talking about that the Chinese student did. So all those are more institutional themes rather than like uh, thematic areas of development or human rights, it's practice itself. So I think I think that. Well, as one of the people who was involved in making the selection, both here and there, I, I would say very much. Um, again, because this is about trying to develop human rights leadership, and one thing that's really needed are is you know a serious attention to um, the state and the management of our organizations. Um, so I, I think that's well within the mark. In particular, if you have had an experience of one that really faltered and you indicate that that's, therefore, if you're very interested in this as a leadership problem. Yeah, uh, why this is important to you, what, what kind of commitments you see yourself making, uh, uh, you know, reach back into your application here as you expressed uh, yourself and why you, want, why you wanted to be a public policy student. Um, and, uh, and, and I think speak to the question of how you see the skills you're trying to develop here are applicable to uh, human rights or good governance uh, kinds of issues. Um, 
Kavita, I think, mentioned that much of what we focused on on, uh, on governance had to do with questions of corruption um, and transparency. Um, uh, we may be doing a bit more than that, but it is a democracy and governance, or a, it's a rights and governance program. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming. Thanks for the presentations, Mike, and the